Celtic uh, writer, um, not a trained theologian, but uh, someone who uh, does some work with Celtic uh, worship pieces. And Priscilla and I have been using one stanza of a piece of his as the opening for our Thursday morning uh, Lenten study. And I want to use a little bit more of one of his blessings to open us, and it is called Morning Offering. I bless the night that nourished my heart, bread for the hunger no one sees. All that is eternal in me welcomes the wonder of this day. May my mind come alive today to the invisible geography that invites me to new frontiers, to break the dead shell of yesterdays, to risk being disturbed and changed. May I have the courage today to live the life that I would love, to postpone my dream no longer, but do at last what I came here for and waste my heart on fear no more. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, and that's from a book of his called To Bless the Space Between Us. And it has some really beautiful poetry and essays in it. So I commend that to you. So this is the last of our Lenten series. Today is that Sunday that in the church is now known as Palm slash Passion Sunday. Uh, I miss the days when Holy Week was so much a part of our uh, church lives that you did uh, Palm Sunday and Maundy Thursday and Good Friday and Holy Saturday and Easter so that you didn't have to try to crush everything into this one Sunday morning because Palm Sunday is, is the last lightness that you get before Holy Week starts and to combine it with passion is always difficult. But um, that is uh, the script in the liturgy uh, and the, the lectionary for today. And so we debated uh, about whether we would do the objects that Jill Duffield identifies for Holy Week and decided that we would stay with uh, a single object rather than trying to put everything in. So the last element that we will focus on uh, from her book, Lent in Plain Sight, is oil. And I discovered when I looked both at her selected readings and thought back for myself about oil, that it is in fact not a single thing. It's not like bread or dust or coins. There are, as there probably are in all our houses, a multitude of different kinds of oils. There are scented oils that you use instead of spray perfume. There are oils that you use for cooking. Probably for most of us, there is no longer oil that you use for lamps, although I still have one of my great grandmother's oil lamps. I've never actually tried to see if it would work. Uh, just sits there as an ornament. And the same thing is true in scripture. Oil is never the main point of any of the stories in which it appears. It is a tool. It is an image or a metaphor. And it grows out of a world that's perhaps as foreign to us as any aspect of the biblical times might be, because we don't. It's like the, the foot washing uh, element in John's gospel. There are things we don't do. We are not the kind of tactile, sensuous uh, culture that would have thought of oil for anointing, uh, oil for 
perfuming and touching other people with oil, oil for healing. Uh, when you look at the Good Samaritan story. But it still is an element of some really wondrous pieces of scripture. And I'm going to take us into a few of them. And we'll talk less about the oil than about the way it's used what it means and how it connects to the, to the scripture. And I want to start with perhaps one of, if not the most familiar passage in all of scripture, the 23rd Psalm. And I'm going to, to read it to you from a translation that may not be as familiar to you. It's from the Jewish Publication Society. It's there translation of the Hebrew scriptures and attempts to use words that are more closely related to how they think the words would have been translated. Uh, you might want to close your eyes or for those of you just to hear these words and listen to uh, the elements that are in it and also for how oil is used in the passage. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me to water in places of repose. He renews my life. He guides me in right paths as befits his name. Though I walk through a valley of deepest darkness, I fear no harm. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table for me in full view of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My drink is abundant. Only goodness and steadfast love shall pursue me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for many long years. So where does oil show up in the 23rd Psalm? Jay, if you unmute. Anointing the head with oil. Mm -hmm. Which now, is not the only place in the Bible that that's mentioned. No, but that in this particular one, and, and you're right, and this may be, this image uh, may be one of those things that, as I said, is among the most foreign to us. I don't know about you, but I have never been to a dinner party, no matter how uh, high end or expensive, in which the host uh, touched my head with oil. Uh, certainly not anointing or pouring it over uh, my head. So what this means sort of putting yourself back there, but but where what do you think it it reflects if you look at it in that just in that paragraph? You spread a table for me, you anoint my head with oil, my drink is abundant. What does oil represent there? Well, it's hospitality, or you know, there's the story where the woman is poor and she you know, pours out everything. Um, I mean, it's extravagance, but I don't know practically, maybe you're going to get to this, but why did they, was there any practical reason they did it? Or it's just- it, uh, There's a little bit, the, the information that I read said it was one of those ways of sort of cleansing. I don't Cleaning. know if oil is cleansing. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, but it was, the word that you used that I like is extravagant. Right, so it wasn't a normal. A normal household you would wash someone's feet. An extravagant moment would be anointing your hair and your feet with the expensive oil. Is it is that in this case, God's abundance is there. God doesn't just 
care. God lavishes care. Uh, it's, it's bigger than just what's necessary for us. And that's a little bit different than when we've talked about bread or even when we talked about coins, we talked about having enough. Um, this is that moment at which God gives us more than enough. Uh, when we go from that moment of ashes and, and repentance to that moment of, of celebration. And, and touch the, the sense of, of connection. You mentioned another one that is perhaps my favorite story um, about oil. And it isn't one that Jill Duffield chose, so I'm sort of going off lectionary here. Elijah and Elisha are two prophets who we don't spend a lot of time with other than the Elijah story uh, when he hears the sounds and God is not in the sounds and or my personal favorite when the angel brings him lunch. Um, but there's another story about Elijah, Elisha, who is Elijah's successor. A certain woman, the wife of one of the disciples of the prophets, cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And now a creditor is coming to seize my two children as slaves. Elisha said to her, tell me what you have in the house. She replied, your maidservant has nothing at all in the house except a jug of oil. Go, he said, and borrow vessels outside from all your neighbors, empty vessels, as many as you can. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your children and pour oil into all those vessels, removing each one as it is filled. She went away and shut the door behind her and her children. They kept bringing vessels to her and she kept pouring. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. He answered her, there are no more vessels and the oil stopped. She came and told the man of God and he said, go and sell the oil and pay your debt and you and your children can live on the rest. So we've gone from oil of extravagance and luxury to oil of abundance. The sense of um, God's, what did someone call it that I read? Provenient grace. But also this incredibly practical grace. Um, you know, what do you have in the house? God will take what you have and make it more than enough. So think for a minute about, we've talked about Lent as letting go, but also let's think about Lent as building up. What is it that you have that you want God to make more of? As a church, what would we like God to look at the meeting house and see what we have and help us make more of? Hold those thoughts in your mind and carry them with you. Think about What would be, what could we be extravagant? About. Because a week from today, we will be celebrating God's enormous miracle. God's absolutely extravagant grace. What would we have, what would we give, what would we do 
that we want God to multiply. Now we'll turn to a different use of oil, perhaps one that's far more familiar. Uh, it is anointing again, but in this case, it's not a host anointing. It's kings being anointed and priests being anointed. It's oil being used to publicly acknowledge and give evidence of a call or a vocation. This is what I'll ask you to actually answer for me. Um, have any of you ever been anointed, probably with uh, water rather than oil, but have you ever been physically anointed at any point? Uh, your baptism okay <laughs> but baptism. We, we weren't we didn't know it or i didn't know it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i grew up in fact i sort of missed that i grew up in a tradition that did uh altar calls and and you know adult baptism so i was fully immersed i didn't have the uh sense of someone doing uh that anointing either the dropping of water or uh, in some traditions they still use oil what do we do to acknowledge vocation what might substitute for anointing for us those of you who've been ordained it's the laying on of hands mm -hmm. You know, I know this might not technically fall under the category of anointing, but I always feel the benediction at the end of a service. Mm -hmm. It says something about now you're touched and should go out into the world. Yeah, that's another way of commissioning uh, people. The other thing that that is sometimes the case, those of us who do the 830 service, when you go up and take communion, um, the, the uh, dipping of the, of the bread into the wine, that sense of doing something tangible to acknowledge whether you've been called as a Christian, called to a particular vocation, Do you remember anointing stories in scripture? Do you remember particular people who were anointed? Well, um, I have acted out the anointing of David with countless children, um, many of whom really liked the idea of having somebody put oil on their hand and touching their head with it. Um, we never did the actual pour it out like they would have out of the horn. But, um, but it's interesting that children don't struggle with being anointed, with being touched, you know, in those kinds of ways like adults do. Um, one time I suggested to children, well, maybe rather than doing your head, we would just do your hand, you know, and they were like, no, 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 you know, it has to be on our head to really count. Um, which I thought was an interesting observation out of a, you know, out of a seven-year-old that, um, you know, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. And we got to have oil on our heads. And so everybody got anointed with oil on their head. Um, and, um, and, and one child observed that, um, that putting oil with it made it a special blessing. And so sometimes mm -hmm. in bridges, sometimes in bridges to worship, um, you know, on what others might call high holy days, we we have frequently anointed with the children to say, you know, you are called, you are special. Often with the baptism story, they want to be they want to be anointed to be touched. Um, 
So, you know, maybe maybe that's what Jesus meant about being reborn and having faith like a child to mm -hmm. not let all of our grown up hangups get in the way of connecting with those spiritual moments. Because there is a connection in the touch uh, that we sometimes lose when we stay safely in our places. It, it's uh, interesting at um, when we pass the peace. Uh, it can get somewhat chaotic uh, if we open the doors and, and go out. And we used to joke at BTS, sometimes it became like a brief happy hour, everybody running around saying hello to people they hadn't seen before. But there is that sense of wanting to uh, touch hands with someone, connect with someone. Oil has that, it, it's, it's, there's a level of consecration, but there's also a level of connection in this, uh, touching it. And then there's the anointing in healing. One of the passages that uh, Duffield picks up is the one where it talks about going to someone's home when they are ill and anointing with oil. Uh, she also talks about the, that point of the Good Samaritan, which has never been one of the parts of the passage that I ever focused on, which was the oil and wine uh, used to try to heal uh, the beaten man's wounds, the oil of compassion that oil has that uh, element of connection. It's a tool for uh, making whole. It's very notable, I think, that in the ancient Near East, <clears throat> uh, liquids with olive oil were a homeopathic method of treating almost all of the skin uh, lesions and diseases and wounds that you might have. <clears throat> the Egyptians especially were very, very uh, adept at using uh, oil-based treatments uh, for healing. One more thing that we need to sort of have in our heads that these were once again tools that would have been, as Jay says, familiar to the people that the gospel writers and the Old Testament writers would have spoken to. It would have been something they would have, as the Samaritan did, carried with him. He had um, the oil there, perhaps for his own use, um, but willingly used it, uh, gave up his own uh, oil to care for this stranger. And then there is the anointing that comes in the Gospels. And the woman anointing Jesus story appears in some form in all four Gospels. And so uh, let's see what between us we remember about the stories. And I'm not going to worry about which story it comes from, but what do you remember the most about the anointing stories that we think of at this time of, of the church season, the church year. I might say, I think, I think of the, uh, the Luke passage 746, uh, where uh, Jesus, for some reason, is in a, in a home and uh, there's a woman comes in with oil and uh, takes care of him uh, with uh, cleaning his feet, uh, anointing him. And then he basically pronounces her forgiven of sins. And he also admonishes those who said, you didn't, you didn't anoint me when I came in. Exactly. She did. She has love and she has faith. So she has forgiven her. Words to that effect. Yes. Yes. Yes, that image of um, the, in this case, hosts inviting him, but not engaging in any form of even basic worship. He said, you didn't even give me water. Uh, 
to wash when I came in and she has uh, anointed me with oil uh, and wiped. What else do you remember? That she doesn't have a name. In Luke and in, I think Mark, she doesn't have a name. She does actually have a name in, in John. We all know he was different. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recall that uh, the anointing is uh, referenced as being uh, the preparation of his body after death, which makes me go back and think about the passage in Psalm 23. Yes. Int oh, nice connection. I like that. Um, because there is this moment, one of the, the things we always have to remember, even on Easter morning when they come with spices and oils to anoint the body. Um, Jews then and now uh, do not embalm their dead. So there was this uh, anointing of the body before it was to be wrapped and placed in a tomb. And they didn't have time before the Sabbath to do that. So the women come again. But he speaks, as Jim says, of the anointing uh, that in that gospel occurs in Holy Week as something she had in preparation for my death. And she's uh, used it now. Anything else in terms of, of one of the words that we used back in uh, talking about Psalm 23? the kind of, of uh, oil that's used. There's actually a fight over it in two of the gospels. Um, the question is the expensive jar of ointment that is used and why wasn't it sold and used to feed the poor. Why did you take this? It's usually this alabaster jar of nard, which is a, a oil a ointment that when you rub it in your hands becomes an oil from the uh, spike nard plant. And in one gospel that has the, the, that discussion, it is a conflict between Judas uh, being sanctimonious and uh, Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, who in John's gospel is the one who uh, performs this anointing. But it is that one more moment of, in this case, extravagant response to the presence of God with us. This sense that something big is required, something out of the ordinary. And so I'll invite you to think for a moment again about what, what makes worship extravagant? What makes our time with God, our response to God, more than every day? Linda, these are very good questions. I think maybe it's just me, but I think extravagance, whether it's kindness or money or whatever, it's because you're moved. It's not rational. It's not like, I mean, I think it's good to ask the questions because it's very interesting, but I feel like people, you do it out of an emotional, it's something deep within you. And it's not like you sit and say, well, how am I going to be extravagant with my resource? Mm -hmm. I don't, just that word, mm -hmm. 
like a deep response and it it's not necessarily rational. That's why it's extravagant. It's not the way we normally, it's not budgeting. <laughs> <laughs> it's Lovely not, thought. It's not practical. I mean, all these stories, they don't make sense based on how we think. And they don't happen over and over again. They uh, happen, as you said, in response to that moment. Uh, to and some people point. may have had that conflict. Well, should I do this or shouldn't, you know, and then you talk yourself down, you know, from being extravagant. It's not, anyway, it's an interesting question and process. But I think you identified something that it is worth thinking about is that extravagant responses, something motivates them. They are a response. You don't decide, you don't get up one morning and decide I'm going to be extravagant today. Uh, or at least I don't usually. But thinking about what it is that brings that response, uh, what aspect of our love for God reaches out uh, to each of us, because I think I think you're absolutely right that it is that kind of response, and each of us is going to respond to something different. To a different motivation, to a different piece of scripture, to a different element of our life as Christians. Linda, I, I, I think um, one of the things, at least for me, that leads to an extravagant response is an, is openness. Mm. Coming into worship with a, a willingness to hear and be open to feelings and thoughts and um, things that are not usual in my life. And when that happens, I find that I want to leave the service um, in silence, not in you know, mm. gathering and talking and catching up with everybody in, in the church service. It's this sense that I have been open and I have received something and I want to, I want to spend some time cherishing it. Lovely. And, and I think sometimes for me, it's the evening services that will somehow do that. The services where we're, whether it's Ash Wednesday or Monday, Thursday, that point at which you're at a place in the in the church year where you let go of the barriers. Um, but I like that. Other people also. I also think Taze services, mm -hmm. places where that is more likely to. Occur. Yes. I was going to say that in the, that time of day, in the evening. Uh, you've been run over all day long and now you can sit back and relax and maybe accept something. Um, so, and it touches you closer. Mm -hmm. Linda, I, I am thinking that part of the experience of extravagance is being in the gathered community. Hmm. I can have an extravagant experience alone, but it is much more powerful sometimes if I'm in the worshiping community. You may and go it can home be, and think about it, but you need to be with people to experience it. And it, it can be contagious. I mean, stinginess can be contagious too. So it's, you know, coming with the intention of being as Tom, as I'm sorry, gosh, as uh, <laughs> Mike said, whom I call Tom Farmer every time, um, <laughs> as Mike said, with the intention of being open. Um, if you're an open to extravagance, it can sometimes sort of rip through the sanctuary almost. <clears throat> Others, Jay? 
Okay, now I'm unmuted. <laughs> I, th I think that has to do with uh, something that we all maybe have experienced at one time or another. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to worship. It's not a thing that you have to do to get through the day. But when you do, you have a recognition that, that this existence and the powers of God are real. And that recognition makes it extravagant. Uh, I, I can't let this go through without mentioning Psalm 104. And I was not aware of Psalm 104 at all until I studied the hymn to Aten by Akhenaten written mm -hmm. years before Psalm 104, in which he praises the power of God and the things that God has given. And it does have an oil reference. It's oil to make his face shine, which I read to be to make you healthy, uh, as the Egyptians normally would have thought of it. But that, that feels like how things have affected me. I recognize, and therefore, it seems right. I think I would point out that Stephen and the virtual choir or the live choir are an extravagant gift to us in worship. I was hoping someone would talk about music because that is one of those uh, listening to a choir that is moved or that is, is skilled in singing music that moves uh, is often one of those extravagant moments uh, for all of us. It's one of the elements of, of worship that can have that impact, can be like oil anointing you. I want to read the uh, one verse from Psalm 104 that Jay mentioned. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, is one you're probably familiar with. O oh Lord, my God, you are great. You are clothed in glory and majesty, wrapped in a robe of light. You spread the heavens like a tent of cloth. You make springs gush forth in torrents. You water the mountains. You make the grass grow for the cattle. You offer wine that cheers the hearts of men, oil that makes the face shine, and bread that sustains man's life. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. So another one of those sort of extravagant moments of gratitude that's there. I, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, I read, I've got Beatner's Listening to Your Life. Oh, yes. And the March 26th one, these moments to me, it's like God in our midst. Um, he doesn't just, you know, a miracle and, and, he, and he presents himself, but these moments of um, human contact and deep appreciation for each other or for whatever, uh, even nature, it's those are moments of that God is, we know he's in our midst. We don't have to wish for him to just show up. He is, he's here. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I love, I love that sense that, that part of what motivates you, whether it is in the music, whether it's in the words, whether it's in just your own moment, something says to you, God is here. Mm -hmm. And your extravagance is a response to that. And, and would that it were a daily experience, but for most of us, uh, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen all the time. It's going, but right. when it happens, as Margaret said in the beginning, that's what makes you respond extravagantly. It is that moment at which you know God has been with you and is with you. And as Mike said, you go home because sometimes you need to take that moment and hold it a little closer mm -hmm. uh, to see where it's going inside you, to see uh, what the oil is anointing in your life in the way that you are. It also, I think it means that we need to 
work harder to acknowledge, to perceive him in our midst. Mm. Uh, and we, we, our days, you know. Maybe that goes back to the openness is that uh, worship is that moment at which you come trying, and since our theme is letting go, and, and Priscilla mentioned this in terms of letting go of our hangups, but letting go of our barriers or expectations or limitations when we go to worship so that you go being open to have that moment of God's presence to which you can respond when you can see the feast spread before you or feel the prayers of someone for you. When you think about extravagance, I want it to remain connected with also elements of these other moments in scripture, the oil of compassion, when the good Samaritan shares uh, what he has, the oil of abundance, when the oil keeps flowing out of the jug, um, one passage that she also uses, which is from an epistle we don't read a lot, which is the epistle of James. And it speaks of, it's the one in which you have uh, those who come to you, uh, come into your house, caring about you, prayers of faith. Are any among you suffering? That the job of the family of faith is to have that compassion, that caring, that supporting, uh, that level of when we pray for others, it is with an openness. It extends the oil of our own compassion and our own care uh, to others. It, it lets us see God's mercy as we extend it to other people. Uh, he specifically offers any who are sick should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Again, this sense of calling to life that oil is a tool a piece of what was essential to life in the ancient world is now still a tool for all of us, uh, but has those moments in which God can use it. God can do with the most mundane things so much more than we anticipate can use us and things uh, around us. I'm gonna encourage you this week, uh, because the anointing stories in the gospels are an element that is usually a part of the liturgy of the week, to go look at them. Uh, they're, In Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 7, and John 12. Look at them as they fit into Holy Week, even though Luke's takes place actually early in Jesus' ministry, 
but it carries forward the same sense of once anointing was for kings and for priests. Oil was, as Margaret said at the beginning, for hospitality. It has a role in healing. It has a role in preparing for death. But when you read these stories, look at them for what they mean to the woman who does the anointing, what it reflects for her, because she's us. In how a disciple responds to the presence of God. Sort of hold her in your minds. And as we come to the end of our time, if there are reflections on any of these elements that we have looked at, dust and ashes, bread, shoes, coins, and now oil, feel free to offer them before I close this with another poem. I might say this has been a, a wonderful way to access the Bible. You know, you sit there and say, well, what will I read in the Bible today? If you pick something and look at what it says about those things, uh, there's, there's a mass of ancient knowledge that is coming to you and would be beneficial, I think. Yeah, I was gonna say, I like the concreteness of focus, mm -hmm. focus but also the abstraction, the symbolism of them. Yeah. That was a very interesting. And also I think Jennifer focused on, you know, seeing shoes or other tangible things as a, a way to remember God or, or worship mm -hmm during everyday, seeing everyday objects to remind you. Lovely. All right, so I'm gonna close us with uh, a poet many of you are familiar with. Uh, Franny's dear friend, Ann Weems. And this will be a little bit of a combination of Palm Sunday and Holy Week as we begin perhaps the longest week in our year, but one that ends in great joy. Balloons, maybe. If Jesus were coming here, We'd line up on either side of his parade route and wave balloons. We'd probably shout and hold up homemade posters saying, welcome Jesus. On the other hand, maybe we'd be quiet. It might be interesting to see him ride that donkey Maybe he'd walk down the middle of the road. What a celebration. And when the parade passed by, we'd go home and look forward to the celebration next Sunday. But what about Holy Week? This is the week in which the days lengthen, the sun shines, and we find ourselves trying to go from Palm Sunday straight to Easter morning. Trying to keep from going into that courtyard where we must answer whether we know him or not. Trying to keep from going anywhere near that cross. So give us the palms and give us a parade, but oh God, whisk us right from Palm Sunday to that great getting up morning. 
Have our Easter baskets filled and waiting for us, oh God, because this year we're tired and we're scared and we just want a little peace and quiet. And so we want to turn and run. Instead, we kneel and pray for mercy and for miracles and eyes to see that God is with us. Blessed be, my friends. May this be a meaningful Holy Week for you all. <clears throat> 